Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Today's scripture is found in Acts 8, verse 22 to verse 23. And it reads, Repent, therefore, of, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Morning, Saints. It's my pleasure to be with you today again. Um, I always like to kneel down and uh, I always like to kneel down and pray one more time before I share the Word of God with you. So, if you'll bow your heads with me, Lord God, speak to us now. We're here to seek you, to pursue your truth, to understand you. I pray, Lord, that uh, some way. Your word will edify us and grow us in the way that we need. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I don't know why it says that my sermon's name is Clean Slate. That's my last sermon. Uh, the title of the sermon today is Prejudice to Love. Prejudice to Love. Um, it's interesting that for many years, Aristotle had said that a heavier object, when dropped, moves faster than a lighter object. And it was like hundreds and hundreds of years before anybody even thought to question that. They simply believed that Aristotle was one of the greatest thinkers of his time. And if Aristotle said it, it must be right. It is true that a heavier object will impact with more force when dropped. But it is not true that a heavier object actually flies through the air with more rapidity. It was not until 1589 that Galileo stood on the precipice overhanging the Leaning Tower of Pisa with two weights, one that weighed 10 pounds and one that weighed one pound. And he had to prove to all of the onlookers that they would hit the ground at the same moment. And they did. 2,000 years, nearly 2,000 years had to pass before this mistruth could be adjusted. Today, we are discussing preconceived ideas. Preconceived ideas that, that oftentimes within our own inborn psyche or developed psyche, we think we have understanding which is often false. Today we're going to be discussing the concept of uh, prejudice. <laughs> prejudice. Prejudice is simply defined as an opinion or a belief, whether conscious or unconscious, that is not based completely on fact. And each human being has been taught from early, early ages, early development about opinions formed about the world around them. These opinions and beliefs are often based on certain experiences that actually did happen, but may have developed into generalizations about life itself. We can prejudge many different things in life, but probably the most controversial issue is prejudice in regards to racial issues. Today I'm going to be discussing racism in the Bible. Not a fun topic, but a topic which the Bible repeatedly addresses. Racism in the Bible. The problem is, is that historically, Jews were set up in some ways, I think, to develop a racist bias. Here's the problem, is that Jews uh, knew that they were called. <laughs> they were called, and they were called... Um, by Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, their, their, their parenthood, their, their leaders of their, of their nation had been called and separated apart. And so they came without a bit of an air of um, importance and expectation. And, and the Bible is very clear that God created a covenant with a particular national group. Well, it's hard not to begin to think that you're something special if you're part of that 
group. And God specifically told them to minimize time spent with other nations because of the negative influence that it would have upon them. Because of idolatry and other immoral practices, God encouraged them to try to spend less, as little time as possible because of the influences that it would bring into their lives. And so, with all of this package that Jews of the Bible inherited, they developed a natural bias. A bias that they were special and privileged, and others were outside of the covenant of God. A bias that was not unconscious bias, as we talk about today, but very much conscious bias. They believed simply that Jews were better than people of other nations. Jews were blessed, others were not. Gentiles were not blessed. And it took the New Testament Christians years and years and years to address this issue. We're going to talk about some of that today. Um, how Israel, Israelites forgot their original calling. God had called them to be something special, it's true. But their calling was beyond them. The Bible says, he says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. But I will make you as a light for the nations. Here, and he says that you shall bring back the preserved of Israel and make you a light. Or my salvation shall reach to the end of the earth. Here, here's a very important concept is that the, the Jews Yes, they were set apart. They were special. But God had made them special so that they could be a light to all the rest of the world. They had lost sight of their great calling. They had begun to think more and more about them themselves being the fulfillment of the great promise. They had forgotten that when God was speaking to Abraham... In Genesis chapter 22, part of the original promise that God had given Abraham was that his offspring shall be, in his offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because they have obeyed his voice. It was, it was to be through their blessing that all the other nations would get a better glimpse of God. But instead of that, the Jews had believed that they were set apart and special, that the others were simply lost, separated from God. Unfortunately, this broken bias entered the New Testament. Let's fast forward now all the way to the New Testament. And some of the racism and nationalism that was rampant in Israel during that time. The Jews had been conquered by another nation, Rome. They were being taxed, persecuted, and in many ways abused. They hated the Romans. It was to them the, it was to them the, the fulfillment of their generalization that Gentiles are bad. Their entire philosophy of the coming Messiah was built upon a nationalistic philosophy. That when the Messiah comes, he will overthrow these horrible Gentiles and once again establish the blessed people of God in the promise that he gave to us. This created inherently a racial prejudice and a theological bias and a confused nationalism. Their belief about the Messiah was all about overthrowing the bad Gentiles and reestablishing God's people. Their teaching ended up being not MAGA, but MIGA, make Israel great again. Their philosophy of Israel was, and the Messiah was all about this, racism, essentially, at its core. They believed it so much so that they believed that it was a positive virtue and a spiritual value to think this way. Satan knew that he could divide and destroy God's people and hurt his mission on earth if he could simply convince God's people to be racist and self-focused. And this is one of the greatest tools that he has been using throughout the history of time. 
all throughout the New Testament and Old Testament, we see, unfortunately, division in the unity of God. Of all moments in time, when the people of God were the most united, if you can look back in, in the history of humanity and find one moment where God's people were the most united, the most committed, the most powerfully following God, it would be that time shortly after Pentecost where thousands of people had been converted and Christians were selling their property and living in a commune experience and supporting one another, sacrificing for the cause. But yet even in that moment, Satan had, had twisted and maligned this circumstance to try to manipulate people and turn them against one another. In Acts chapter 6, verse 1, there became an issue that arose. I already preached about this a few weeks ago, but I'm talking about the history of racism in Christianity. It says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. By the way, it's not clear from Scripture whether that was actually happening or whether some people felt like that was happening. Either way... There was a division that had happened, and, and Satan saw it. He saw the unity and the direction that the church was heading. He said, I have to destroy this. What more can I do? I know what I'll do. I will make them try to get into racial issues again. Today, we may become discouraged by the prejudice that is all around us. Let us remember that in the moment where there was the most unity ever in, in world history, in a Christian experience, there were still issues of racism, unfortunately. I believe that this issue of racial prejudice must be addressed and must be confronted directly and respectfully, but at the same time, let us not think that ever in this life, this issue will completely disappear. Bias, generalizations, and prejudice is part of our broken human nature. And that being said, it has infected the New Testament church from its very inception. Today we're going to be talking about some prejudice that existed. Probably the, the deepest prejudice that the New Testament Christians had. And that was the prejudice against Samaritans. After the stoning of Stephen, so we've been going on a history now through the through the book of Acts. We're now in Acts chapter 8. We covered, in our last story, my last sermon, we covered the stoning of Stephen and how after the stoning of Stephen, it led to a massive persecution against all of the Christians. And there were a lot of Christians in um, Jerusalem and they had to flee and run for their lives because of the persecution. And as the people began to flee, it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Now, previously, to this moment, all of the Christians had been huddled into their little groups with like-minded people that were ethnically and theologically like them. I believe that it was something that God allowed the persecution to force Christians to fulfill the mission which God had, pro had proclaimed that they were supposed to do. It was only after this that the gospel goes to Samaria in a powerful way. The very next verse, Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And to the Jews, I mean, you have to place yourself in the mindset of the Jews. To them, they're thinking, Samaria? Samaria? Why, of all places, why would you go to Samaria? They believed that the Samaritans were beyond salvation. They believed that they were outside of the covenant and there was nothing that could be done to save those horrible and wicked and worthless people. That was the mindset of the Jews of those days. We have to go through a little bit of the history of the hatred between Jews and Samaritans and unpack it a little bit. And I believe that it may, in the end, shed some light on the brokenness that still lives within our human society. The history of the hatred. There had been a long history of hatred between Jews and Samaritans. Samaritans, who are they in the first place? That's a question that we should ask. Well, 
At one point in time, you remember that the ten northern tribes had been conquered by Assyria, destroyed, and many, many Jews, or not, sorry, not Jews, many Israelites from uh, the ten northern tribes had been deported and removed to different nations throughout the world. And then they brought other people from other nations and brought them into Israel. They did this so that they could mix people so that there couldn't be like an, another uprising. If they got people all mixed up and they didn't have uh, an ethnic identity or a theological identity, they couldn't uh, grow roots and, and redevelop a revolution and go against their, the, the kingdom which had conquered them, which was at that time Assyria. And so what happened is uh, Israel became a mishmash of all kinds of different ethnic groups. Some of them Jewish, some of them not. They all intermarried, and their theology became very uh, a mishmash as well. The Jews, that is the people from the tribe of Judah who were still trying to believe in the Bible and follow God's plan, had also left God in many ways, had been taken as captives to Babylon, and, and had come back afterwards. And, and at that time, they were going to rebuild Jerusalem and reestablish the, the sanctuary and the, the system of sacrifices. And people from Samaria came and said, hey, we want to help you rebuild the temple. We want to be part of this. The Jews said, I'm sorry, but we really don't want to have anything to do with you. You guys worship idols and at the same time claim to worship God. That's one of the problems that we got into in the first place. That's why we ended up in a position where we were taken captives to Babylon. We do not want to be part of that. You guys go do your own thing. From that moment forward, there became a huge antagonism between Samaritans and Jews. Well, even before that, during the building of the city, you can read the, the story of uh, Nehemiah and the book of Ezra. There was a huge antagonism between uh, groups that were really Samaritans and the Jews. They hated each other. The Jews built their temple. The Samaritans went in and established their own temple. And they would talk bad about one, each other, one another and their worship. It got so bad that Samaritan became a curse word. Samaritan became a curse word in Israel. You know, when I was younger, I used to struggle a bit with cursing. And uh, somehow I started hanging around some other kids that had developed a bad language. And I picked it up from them and was using some foul language. At some point, I decided that I was convicted about it. I wanted to stop. So I asked my friends who are Christian, help me stop cursing. And they said, okay, this is what we're going to do. If any bad word comes out of your mouth, we're going to punch you. I thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. At least, you know, it helped trigger. Well, it worked for a little while, but my arm started getting sore after a few hours. And uh, eventually God has helped me address my language issues. And by God's grace, I try not to ever use curse words today. But back in the days of Jesus, the word Samaritan was a curse word. I'll show you the story. It's kind of crazy. Um, <clears throat> Jesus had been talking with the Pharisees and he had explained to them that they were slaves to sin and error and confusion. They responded back and they said, we're not the offspring. we are not slaves, we're the offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved. How is it that you say that we need to be set free? Jesus said, listen, you're not the sons of Abraham. You have a different father. Because if you were the sons of Abraham, you would accept me because Abraham spoke of me. Well, they didn't like that and so they attack Jesus back and they say, sorry, this is uh, Jesus speaking to them. He says, you're doing the works your father did. And they said, we're... Jesus, they respond to Jesus and they say, we were not born of sexual immorality. In other words, they knew that Mary got pregnant before Joseph and Mary were engaged or before they were married, rather. And so they say, hey, you're a product of sin, uh, there's uh, another curse word that refers to children born out of wedlock. They were using that word in reference to Jesus. I'm not going to say it out loud, but you probably know the word, unfortunately. Uh, so Jesus responds to them after they call him uh, a man born of sin. And he tells them these words. You are of your father, the devil. 
and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Ouch. Now, of all things that Jesus has said, this has got to be one of the most harsh things he has ever said. Tough words. He calls them children of Satan. Many people say that Jesus was always gentle. Listen, brothers and sisters, Jesus was always right. He was not always gentle. There are some moments where Jesus uses some pretty tough language. He calls them children of Satan. They're trying to think of some other thing to attack Jesus back with. And the worst thing they can think to say to him, the worst curse they could call upon him, is they said, you the Jews answered him, are you not right? Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? That was the worst cuss they could think of. You're a Samaritan. That's what you are. Samaritan, to call a Jew a Samaritan was one of the most offensive things you could possibly do because Samaritans were the bottom of the barrel. My wife hails from the beautiful country of Romania. There's been a lot of racial issues in the country and her upbringing, primarily between what's considered white Caucasian Romanians and another group, the gypsy group. Um, they have a word in Romanian for gypsies, which the gypsies do not call themselves because it's kind of derogatory. But if you really want to offend a Romanian, you call them a gypsy. They even have an adjective. They made an adjective for the word gypsy, uh, tsigonesque. And if you want to offend a Romanian, you tell them you're dressed in a tsigonesque way. Those are fighting words in Romanian. Those are fighting words. How dare you? I, and people get in fights over that. How dare you? That's a cuss word. You called me uh, somebody that is like this. I know many of you here are from Romania. Maybe you have experienced the history of the issues, and I'm not trying to say that there has not been fights and issues that have been founded on reality. The problem is, is that when we use a generalization to categorize an entire people group, right? That's the problem. <clears throat> I'm going through all of this to explain so that you understand the depth of the hatred that Jews had for Samaritans. I, I think that we don't understand how much antagonism Jews had against Samaritans. And that's why when Jesus tells the parable of the, quote, good Samaritan, it was a huge issue. I don't think we get it. We don't realize like how big of a problem it was that Jesus made the good Samaritan the hero and made the priest and the Levite the bad guys of the story. To, I mean, no Jew would ever tell that story. That was extremely offensive to everyone listening in the crowd. For, for Jesus to tell the story of the cherished leaders, the priests and the Levites being bad people who don't help someone in need, and the Samaritan being the good guy, to them it was just too much for them to handle. That's why at the end of the story, Jesus asks the question, which one of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer cannot even get the word out. He will not say the word. He cannot combine the word Samaritan and righteous in the same sentence. To him, it's offensive. And so all he can say is, the one who showed mercy. Jesus had been working to upset and pull out the rug from under the racism of his own people, but it was so deeply ingrained. It was so deeply ingrained. That's why when you see this verse about God's people going to the Samaritans and converting large swaths of people, that is crazy whenever you understand the depth of hatred that they had. And you can think about all of the other stories of the issues between the Jews and the Samaritans. In the autobiography of Mahatma Gandhi, 
he wrote that during his students' days, he read the gospel very seriously. He read the Bible. And he considered converting to Christianity. He was going to become a Christian, actually. He believed that the teachings of Jesus taught a solution to the brokenness of the caste system that existed in India. If you're not familiar, in India, uh, historically, there was a caste system, and, and, and you were born into a certain caste, and you can't help it. And if you're born into this group, you're supposed to marry people of that group or stay within your caste. And, and there are certain categories of people, and the very bottom caste in India is called the untouchables. And, and people, their own Indian people thought of people in that caste basically as Samaritans. People that you should not even be around. They're so horrible. Mahatma Gandhi saw that his own people were being torn apart by the brokenness of, of racism against their own race. <laughs> and he saw inside of Christianity the solution to this brokenness. So what did he do? One Sunday, Mahatma Gandhi went to church. And he, went, he wanted to go talk to the local minister to learn how to be a Christian. But he entered the sanctuary. And as he, as he got in there, an usher refused to give him a seat. Why? Because he was an Indian. Gandhi left church never to return. He said, if Christians also have an issue with caste then what can I learn from them? Gandhi went to his death saying, the teachings of Christ are true, the followers of Christ are wrong. Today within the United States, I don't understand, but the brokenness of race issues still exists. <laughs> I honestly was quite ignorant to some of the race issues that exist in the South uh, because I grew up in California. Um, and I didn't experience a lot of, uh, a lot of r reality. I didn't move to the South until I was in my 20s. Um, I think I was about 24, 25 years old when I first moved to the South. I lived in Southern Arkansas. Uh, my job was a Bible worker. I, my job was to go knock on doors and invite people to study the Bible and learn more about Jesus. And uh, I spent a lot of my time working in um, projects, uh, predominantly uh, among African-American people groups. And uh, I had never been treated so um, aggressively in my life. And I didn't I didn't know why, why it was happening, because it was not something that I had experienced growing up in California. But everywhere that I've moved, I've seen it. In California, there was prejudice against Mexicans. In Nebraska, there was prejudice against Native Americans. In the South, I see issues between historical white, black racial issues. But even my own people, my family group is from uh, Ireland and Scotland. Whenever they immigrated to the United States, they were greatly oppressed. And so by other white people, <laughs> because they're bad, because they're Irish people. The world around us is broken, broken. And now what we're realizing is that a thing called unconscious bias. Though we may not intentionally try to have racial beliefs, we have developed generalizations that lie in our, in our unconscious thoughts. <laughs> unconscious bias. They've actually done a lot of studies to prove that unconscious bias is a real thing. They had people, they created resumes um, with white sounding names and resumes with black sounding names. And they realized that, uh, fifth, that the people who, these fake resumes, they received calls back from the employers 50% more frequently to the white sounding names rather than to the black sounding names, even though the qualifications were equivalent. The qualifications and experience were equivalent. The reality is, 
that many of the employers believed unconsciously that a white individual could fulfill the job better than a black individual. And they would not state that out loud, but their actions fulfilled and proved their unconscious bias. And many of us say, oh yeah, but not me. <laughs> but not me. I don't have this unconscious bias. Brothers and sisters, we have to be honest with ourselves to realize that each and every one of us have developed some kind of broken prejudice that, that have been taught to us from infancy. Against whom and how? Against what people group or against what a gender or ethnicity? I do not know. But all of us have unconscious bias. All of us. I didn't ask permission for my wife to share this story, but she'll, I'll probably get in trouble afterwards. Um, my wife, from a very unconscious bias, is taught to you as a, as a tiny child. Okay? My wife was on a bus one day as a young, young child, probably three years old. And uh, people were holding on to the straps and stuff like that. And she told somebody, don't hold on to the handles in the bus. And they said, why? And she said, because there's germs. Her mom was a kind of a germaphobe, still is. And she, she was telling the people on the bus, don't touch the handles because there's too many germs. And they said, little girl, you're three years old. Do you know what germs are? And she said, yes, germs are gypsies. Three years old. Her mom never said that germs are gypsies. But her mom had created a bias that gypsies are unclean. Listen, I'm not here to hate on my wife or her mom, but I'm here to identify a reality that we, we program our own children with brokenness. Perhaps it's not, perhaps, I, perhaps my kids don't know about that particular bias, but they've been developing some. Whatever the bias is, I don't know. But when adulthood comes, they're going to discover their own bias that I, that I programmed into them, that I reinforced because of my own generalizations that damaged my own kids. Brothers and sisters, we have to try to make choices to be intentional to break down our own unconscious bias so that we don't unconsciously pass it on to our own children. With a world around us that is breaking at the seams, we've seen just in very recent years a lot of very serious issues with George Floyd, race riots. You know, after the George Floyd incident, I was, I was going to go protest. Um, but then the protest became violent, and I was afraid to be associated with violent protest. So I chose not to protest. The problem is, I didn't do anything else to protest. Do you see what I mean? Because I was afraid to be associated with that, I did nothing, because I didn't know what else to do. There's a story, a silly story about two apples that were hanging on a tree. And the first apple said, look, all these people are fighting, they're robbing each other, they're rioting. No one seems willing to get along with his fellow man. Someday, we apples are going to be the only ones left, and we will rule the world. But then one apple said to the other apple, which one, the reds or the greens? <sighs> yes, it makes a point, the point that brokenness seems to pervade everything in this world. Prejudice runs deep, deeper than we realize. Deeper, deeper than even unconscious bias. There's a saying which I very much like. It says, given half a chance, people will often crawl out of the boxes in which we have relegated them. <laughs> Given half a chance, people will often crawl out of the boxes into which we have relegated them. 
The profound thing that changed God's people is the Great Commission. That is the, the one thing that, that forced them to address their prejudice. Because in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, God said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, the Jews would have probably had no problem with that except for there was one word that said Samaria. And they're like, wait a minute, okay, yeah. To, to, when, when he says the word Jerusalem, say, yeah, amen. When they say Judea, yes, amen. But then when he gets the word Samaria, oh, whoa, hold on, Jesus. I don't know about that one. Can those people be saved? In fact, <clears throat> they remembered Jesus' previous teaching in Acts, and sorry, Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus said, sent out the 12 disciples. And he said, he, these 12 Jesus sent out, and he commanded them, do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They said, amen, that's right, Jesus. Not to the Samaritans, not to the Gentiles. Jesus was trying to explain that there is a process of time. The first people you go to is your own people. That wasn't the end of the story. <clears throat> when they got to the point where they realized, okay, we've, we've uh, conquered Jerusalem, they were not ready to leave. It wasn't until persecution forced them to leave Jerusalem that they brought the gospel elsewhere. And so one thing we can probably learn from this, brothers and sisters, is the reality that if something has happened to you, maybe God is allowing it for a process of growth. <clears throat> the Samaritans were the Jews' bitterest enemy, and yet they were the place of asylum during persecution. Think about that. When their own people, the Jews, led by the persecution of Saul were killing Christians left and right, one of the first places that they could flee to was Samaria. <laughs> the place where they thought they would never want to spend a day. In fact, the Jews literally would go around Samaria. They would go miles and miles and miles walking out of their way just so they wouldn't have to walk through Samaria. And yet the first place that they ran to when their lives were in danger was Samaria. <clears throat> it was an asylum for God's people. It was the first great mission field. <laughs> after Jerusalem. You remember the story of the woman at the well. God's people never understood that. God's people never really got why, uh, got why Jesus would even talk to a Samaritan woman in the first place. But Jesus understood what he was doing. He was breaking down prejudice because he knew that someday his disciples were going to come back to this place. And he wanted their truth to be received well. <clears throat> At the end of the story, you remember how amazing it was. It says, many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word the woman testified. He, they said, he told me all that I ever did. And so when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed of his own word. Many Samaritans were being converted during the lifetime of Jesus. And it's interesting because if you look in the Gospel of John, uh, the woman at the well is chapter 4, very much towards the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It happens right after chapter uh, 2 is uh, the wedding at Cana. Chapter 3 is Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus. Chapter 4 is the woman at the well. So it's early in Jesus' ministry. Does that make sense? Early in his ministry. <clears throat> the disciples are confused about why Jesus spent any time witnessing to the Samaritans. And Jesus was more than anything, not just winning Samaritans, but trying to teach his own people that everyone needs truth and everyone needs love. But after three and a half years of Jesus' disciples learning of him, their prejudice was still very much intact. <laughs> Their prejudice was still very much intact. One day, um, Jesus was on his way to one of the feasts in Jerusalem. This was shortly before Jesus died. 
It says, And when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face towards Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him, and he went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Listen, you do have to understand some of the context of their time. Hospitality in that day was a sacred honor. It was a sacred honor to offer hospitality. We don't understand anything about hospitality. People talk about southern hospitality. Southern hospitality is a far distant understanding from biblical hospitality. In biblical times, hospitality was a sacred honor. To give somebody water was something that you would never refuse. Remember, when Jesus asked the woman at the well, the one thing that he knew could bridge the gap was, please give me water. Because nobody would, give, would deny that to their worst enemy. Nobody would deny that to their worst enemy. And so when Jesus sends people ahead and says, hey, please prepare a way for me. I need to stay in, in your village in Samaria. Open the door for me because I'm on my way to Jerusalem. They said, hey, look, we would have we made place for you. But because you're on your way to Jerusalem and we hate Jews, you can't. We're not going to put you up for the night. James and John believed that it was honorable to ask Jesus if they should call down fire from heaven. Jesus is like, man, at that point, I can't imagine Jesus just throws his hands up like, are you kidding me? Like, three and a half years, we've been together three and a half years, and that's the question you ask me. They remember the story of Elijah. Elijah called down fire from heaven. And in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 10, so Elijah answered and said to the captain of the 50, if I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And they say, Elijah did it. It was righteous when Elijah did it. We should call down fire from heaven on these horrible Samaritans for not honoring our master. And Jesus simply replies with he rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they simply went to another village. Brothers and sisters, I go through all of this history of brokenness to help us realize that unfortunately, we broken human beings stand in good company with all of the other broken human beings that preceded us. And let us not be so confident to believe that in some way we do not fit into that group with James and John. Perhaps we are not calling down fire from heaven on any one people group. But our own brokenness still lies within our heart. The generalizations that we have created through our history. That is within us. It's Satan's Hold still in the broken human heart. But what changed it? What changed? How is it that they went to Samaria and converted lots of people? Here in the story, in Acts chapter 8, verse 4 through 8, it says, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits were crying out with a loud voice and came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. What changed? What changed? How did it go from the disciples wanting to call down fire to the disciples lovingly reaching people for Christ? Well, we would like to believe that it was the Holy Spirit's descent on Pente at Pentecost. And in some ways, that's true. But I already showed you another Bible story where even while they were living in a commune, there was controversy. And we would like to believe that after this moment, forevermore, all Christians loved everyone and there were never any more issues and everybody lived happily ever after. Unfortunately, it's just not true. So 
So what did change? Something changed to some degree. They got to the point where they at least believed Samaritans were able to be saved. Well, I would like to suggest that what changed was the persecution forced them to mingle with other human beings and see that they are human beings just like them. <laughs> they are other human beings just like them. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there are many other stories in the distant future past Pentecost where we see people still having issues with ethnic problems. Uh, just look at the story of the Jerusalem Council. The question was, can we um, have Gentiles join Christianity? Yes, we know that they can join now. Well, some of them didn't even know that. That was still an issue. That was even at the Jerusalem Council, which was at least 15 years after Jesus died. Okay? At least 15 years later, some were still questioning whether Gentiles can even be Christians at all. And then others agreed that they could be Christians, but they're not sure if they have to be circumcised yet. And so they were still struggling with this stuff. Years into the future, what parts of the Old Covenant still apply? What parts don't? Is there still a separation between Jews and Gentiles? And, and man, it took Paul conversation after conversation. And we like to think that it was just like some Christians who were kind of messed up. But, but Paul says very clearly that Many, many leaders in, in Christianity were struggling with this. In Galatians, it says, But when Cephas, that's Peter, Peter, one of the great disciples of Jesus, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Why did he oppose him? Because he stood condemned. For before certain men came, James, before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews accepted hypocritically, acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by the hypocrisy. And when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force a Gentile to live like Jews? This is years after the cross, saints. Years. They're still trying to decide if it's okay to eat with Gentiles or not. Are you following this? And, and by the way, this addresses many other issues of feast days. Uh, and people say, oh, but people kept feast days after the cross. Brothers and sisters, it took them years to try to figure out what still applies from the Old Testament and what doesn't. That took decades for them to work through that stuff. Don't don't say, oh, because so-and-so did something in the Bible, that means that that was God's plan or organization. No, no, no. We have clear evidence of great leaders making bad mistakes in history. What we know today is simple. That throughout the New Testament, even years into the Christian church, they were still struggling with issues of racism. It took them a long time before they even got to the point where they realized that Gentiles hold the same place that they do in the Christian church. <clears throat> and I'm thankful they did because I'm a Gentile. <laughs> and probably the vast majority of everybody here is, unless you're actually ethnically a Jew. I want to close with this. Um, there was a man named General Robert E. Lee. <clears throat> Uh, you know that name because he was one of the great generals of the Confederate Army who fought for the South. Well, not long after the American Civil War ended, he visited a church in Washington, D.C. And during the communion service, General Lee knelt down beside a black man. And an onlooker saw him and after the church service asked him, how could you do that? How could you kneel down beside a black man? General Lee replied, my friend, all ground is level beneath the cross. All ground is level beneath the cross. Thankfully, we are somewhat past the American Civil War. We are somewhat past the practices of slavery, and yet we still have brokenness. 
The 1960s have come and gone, and yet there's still some residual issues left over. Sadly, decades later, it's still like the Christians were after Jesus had already taught them many teachings of life. How can we overcome this, brothers and sisters? We will overcome it in the exact same way that the disciples of the New Testament overcame it. And that is by powerful service. That is by motivation to serve. That is by fulfilling the Great Commission. When our greatest priority is to find people to love and serve as Jesus, those things begin to fade and our broken, unconscious bias begins to change. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, I have a couple of appeals. My appeals are specific in nature. I see within our own congregation a beautiful diversity. I love it. And yet, as soon as the benediction is said, I see people in their little cliques. And most of the time, quite frequently, it is cliques based on ethnic groups. How is this? Yes, I know it's fun to talk to people who speak your language or understand your cultural background or whatever. We all like that to a degree. We all enjoy that to some extent. But brothers and sisters, let's push past the cliques. We have to force our ourselves to spend time with people that come from very different cultural backgrounds than us. And yes, some of that is going to grate on us because it's different. But as we push past that uncomfortable moment, we get, begin to see each other's hearts. The heart that, yes, we're all broken, <laughs> and yet the heart that we all love Christ in one another. Amen. My final appeal is to serve and to serve with passion. To find individuals to serve that are very different than your own, your own family. To find people to serve that are perhaps affected by the prejudice of your grandparents. Serve and serve with your heart. And through this, by God's grace, Jesus will transform our lives. Amen. With this, let us stand and sing our closing hymn. The hymn is page number uh, 457, so if it's not on the screen, please uh, pull out your hymnal books and open up to page 457 for the closing song.
sisters, let us bow our heads together. Lord God, thank you for your love, the story of your love. It's, it gets past all of our brokenness. You example perfect, selfless love for us. Lord, we want to live that love out in our lives. Lord, we want, to, we want that love to break down all of our own prejudices. The, even the unconscious ones that we don't even realize we have. Lord, may that love pervade our lives to the point where people will know that we are something different, different from the world around us, because we're filled with you. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.